Chapter 13 The Road to Baghdad My first job in Iraq was working as security for American network ABC News. Flying into Jordan, I wasn't worried about what I might have got myself into. I was overwhelmed with excitement at being back in the mix again. When I reached the Jordan-Iraq border, an ex-SAS guy I knew called Ben was there to pick me up. He explained that he had some weapons buried in a cache across the border and that as soon as we got into Iraq, we'd collect them. I was rubbing my hands together thinking I cannot wait to get back on the tools. Shortly after crossing into Iraq, we came to a halt and Ben shot off to pick up the weapons. When he returned, he passed me this tiny little Tokarov pistol. It was so small I could hardly get my finger in the trigger guard. It looked like the kind of thing a female bomb villain would keep hidden in her garter. Except it didn't have a mother of pearl handle, it had a rusty metal one. I said to Ben, are you taking the piss? Don't worry about it, mate. There's not much threat about it at the moment. I got back in the vehicle, looked at this gun and thought, this is pathetic. My dreams were shattered. I was supposed to be rear protection on the transit, but I'd have been better off with a sack full of rocks. As soon as we got to Baghdad, we started our security detail for ABC. This usually involved ferrying them around the city, mostly in ones and twos. It was only a few months after the country had been invaded and Saddam Hussein's statue had been toppled in Ferdos Square. So it was quite tense in Baghdad at the time. One day, a massive explosion went off near our compound. We jumped straight into our vehicles and soon came upon a building that had been reduced to a smouldering pile of rubble. The building had been the Canal Hotel, which the United Nations used as its headquarters in Iraq. We later learned that a 500-pound bomb had been delivered in a cement truck. We were the first people on the scene and found a handful of people trapped under the rubble, one of whom turned out to be a Brazilian diplomat called Sergio Vieira de Mello. We tried to dig him out, but he died at the scene. At least 22 people died in that explosion, including a British citizen. Because we arrived before the US military, we were taken into the inner cordon, where I started taking pictures of the devastation. I didn't think anything more of it until later that night when one of the ABC journalists came to see me and asked to see my pictures. I did a deal with Associated Press and the pictures were in newspapers and on websites all over the world. I should have got more than the $2,000 Associated Press paid me, but it was enough to buy myself a laptop on the black market. When I got the laptop back to my hotel room, I asked ABC's ops people to drop me an internet cable down to our room. Me and my old mate Mick were the only people on the security team with a connection and we spent a lot of time messing about on chat rooms, surfing the net and shopping. But a few days after our internet was installed, it went down, as did everyone's at ABC Towers in Baghdad. Soon, we got word that all the servers had gone down at Disney who were ABC's parent company in America. Everything had crashed. Nothing was working. Then an ABC journalist in Baghdad received a phone call from Disney HQ. Have you got somebody working for you called Ollie? Yes. Does he have a laptop? The laptop I bought off the black market had a virus on it. And that virus had taken out the whole of Disney's network. I killed Mickey Mouse. There was a tentative hope that the war was already over and the various news organisations were assessing their need for security. We had a detail of about six guys and we cost a couple of grand a day per person. And because security was so expensive, any opportunity a news organisation had to get rid of some people and save a bit of money, they took it. I was made up to team leader and my first operation was to pick up the ABC bureau chief from Jordan and driving back to Baghdad, which was something like a 28-hour round trip. There were no flights coming into Iraq because of the threat of surface-to-air missiles. But it wasn't just the bureau chief I had to bring back. It was him and 11 others. And I was only allowed to take one colleague with me. And we only had access to soft-skinned civilian vehicles. In the military, it would be the other way around. 12 security personnel for two civilians and we'd have armoured vehicles. But we were trying to keep the ABC people happy and make sure we kept getting paid, so we did it. 
It was a decision made against our better judgment. But what could possibly go wrong? We knew the Bureau Chief was coming to assess the need for security. So on the drive to Jordan, I kept thinking, fucking hell. I left everything for this. My home, my wife, my child. And if this bloke decides we're not needed, it could all end tomorrow. I was trying to get some balance back into my life, do something that made me feel alive, and this job seemed like it might be it. So I kept on telling myself over and over again, this cannot possibly end. Every time I desperately wanted something to happen, I devoted a lot of time to visualising it. I hadn't wasted time worrying too much about the journey, but stayed focused on the destination. I'd stoke the passion, live the ultimate moment, imagine what achieving the goal might look and feel like. I did the same before joining the Royal Marines and the same before joining the SBS. By the time I got in, I'd already been there a thousand times. So when we got to the Intercontinental Hotel in Amman, I was sitting at the bar with my number two, Dave, when I turned to him and said, look, mate, this contract cannot end. So this is what's going to happen for them to have to extend it. We're going to leave here, pick the 12 of them up and drive them to the border. Then, somewhere between Fallujah and Ramadi, we're going to get attacked. We're going to have a gunfight. We're going to get the ABC people out of it. And when we get to Baghdad, there's going to be a hero's welcome. And once the champagne's been popped, the bureau chief is going to sign a new contract on the spot. I told Dave this story in the minutest detail. Made him live it with me. He thought I was joking, but I wasn't. I might have told the story in a light-hearted manner, but I was deadly serious. As strange as it might sound, I was living a moment that I desperately wanted to happen. I didn't actually think we were going to get shot at, but I did talk about it as a possibility. And when I was describing it, I could smell the cordite from the bullets. Then having arrived at the final destination, I could taste the champagne and feel the bubbles tickling my nose. I could feel the coldness of the glass in my hand and the firmness of the Bureau Chief's handshake. And I could see the look of gratitude on his face. After telling Dave my story, we got chatting to two girls who worked for British Airways. I ended up with a pilot. Dave ended up with a flight attendant. We all ended up in their rooms and what happened, happened. That story is relevant, in case you're wondering, but you'll have to find out why later. At 3am the following morning, we met the Bureau Chief and his entourage and set off in a convoy of four vehicles. Four in each vehicle in front of us and me and Dave bringing up the rear. Customs on the border was a horrible experience as usual, made even worse by the amount of gear the ABC guys had with them. They were all wearing Rolex watches, they had piles of camera equipment, cases of money, and there were lots of eyes on us. Eventually, we made it through, pulled over, put our body armour on and headed for Baghdad, which was still about 10 hours away. There was not much to see on the road from Amman to Baghdad. There was sun, of course, searing a mighty hole through acre after acre of blue. Camels and goats foraging for unseen greenery the odd bomb crater and chewed up vehicle, including a bright red Ferrari, which would have made more sense on the moon. A mile after mile of highway, hugged by a watery haze and cutting a swathe through the flat and featureless desert landscape. And suddenly, there I was, staring into the eyes of a young boy, his AK-47 pointed at my face. It was the chimpanzee attack all over again. Either I lay down and accept my fate, or I went to a less comfortable place in the hope of improving my, our, situation. The MP5 Kurtz is a short weapon, but you should use it two-handed. It's difficult to describe the complexity of using a weapon like that in a close quarter battle scenario, while trying to keep control of a vehicle travelling at 130 kilometres per hour. There is absolutely no margin for error, and you could end up shooting your own arm off but I had no choice at that moment but to pull a gangster move. I popped the weapon off my lap, rested it on my arm, and the boy's eyes almost popped out of his head. I shouted, open fire, before Dave and I squeezed off two sharp bursts, which shattered the closed windows on our vehicle. The enemy's car veered into the central reservation to their left. 
while I slammed my foot down and put as much distance as I could between our vehicle and the enemies as quickly as possible. It was all over in a couple of seconds. Dave and I squeezed our triggers and that was it. I don't know how many bullets hit the car or if anyone inside was hit. There weren't Hollywood blood splatters or screams and the vehicle didn't go up in flames and billow pink smoke. But I could see black plumes pouring from the bonnet and knew they weren't coming after us. The backup vehicle had also slowed down, which was an added bonus. When I looked ahead, I could see the ABC bureau chief with his hands and face pressed up against the window, his eyes like saucers. The smell of cordite singed my nostrils and my ears were filled with a piercing ringing. As soon as it was likely that the enemy vehicles weren't coming after us, I got straight on the radio to Baghdad and told them what had happened. No casualties our side. I believe there may be casualties on their side and headed home. Dave and I didn't say much for a few hours. We were still on high alert. It was only when we entered the relative safety of Baghdad that Dave said to me, Fuck me. Didn't you say that was going to happen? When the compound gates opened, there was a welcoming party to greet us, exactly as I'd imagined. When I got out of the vehicle, I thought I'd drop some coins on the floor. It was the first noise I'd been able to make out since the gunfight, other than the terrible ringing. When I looked down, there were empty shell cases and shards of glass sprinkled around my feet. Someone handed me a flute of champagne and I felt the coldness of the glass in my hand and the bubbles tickling my nose. And then the bureau chief appeared with the contract in his hand, gave me a firm handshake, and we signed on the spot. Dave must have thought I was a witch. Obviously, the news crew were over the moon, but it was a highly sensitive incident. Whenever you take that kind of action, it gets scrutinized in forensic detail. You have to be 100% justified. The force needs to be appropriate. There can be no overkill. So there were no immediate pats on the back. I'm sure if we'd been engaging bandits on a regular basis, a lot of questions would have been asked. But we were confident we'd taken the correct action in exceptional circumstances, and we had three cars full of witnesses. And when the email came in from ABC bosses, we were vindicated. It read, We greatly appreciate your quick thinking and positive action. On behalf of all at ABC News, we'd like to say thank you and well done. When I was back in Special Forces, I had so many support elements. I could call in naval gunfire or an airstrike. I had so much armour. I had someone to my right, someone to my left, and someone above and below. I just felt invincible. But I can't say I was angry at having ended up in such a dangerous situation. Yes, we were totally outgunned. Just from that one car that was onto us, we were outnumbered two to one. We were supposed to be the experts, but I just thought... This is just the way they do things in this world. You can't do these jobs expecting military processes and protocols. They didn't have the money or the manpower. And the bottom line was, we just couldn't have turned the job down. If we had, they would have employed another security company. The smirks of my colleagues' faces told me everything I needed to know. Far from being upset or spooked, I was elated. All soldiers enjoy a contact. I'd have felt guilty if people on our side had been injured or killed. But it was a successful mission. The perfect scenario. A dream come true. Literally. When I went to bed that night and pulled the covers up to my chest, I did wonder about that kid and whether I killed him. He wasn't a soldier. He was just an opportunist and a misfit. But you can't feel guilty for long. Not when the alternative was getting blasted in the face. It was another breakpoint in my life that made perfect sense. It was a defining and spiritual moment and an extremely powerful one. Being attacked by that chimpanzee is still the most terrifying thing that has happened to me. But it was a breakpoint on the road to back dad that had the greatest influence on me. That gunfight in Fallujah was the universe saying, show this idiot that this visualization stuff works. Well, it's hard enough. See it in enough detail, invest enough emotion in it, and it will happen. I had suspected it did, but what happened on the road to Baghdad was like being knocked on the head. Boom! I wouldn't say it changed my life on the spot. It was many years before I fully understood the implications. 
but it was the first step down a different path. Everything I've done since then has been a reflection of that moment, especially in recent years. Whether it was my business or the television program, it all happened because of visualization. It might even be the case that the first time visualization worked in my life was when I hit the Mitchell sister with my bike because I couldn't stop thinking about all the horrible things I wanted to do to her. So anyone who says visualization doesn't work is missing out. I truly believe that we all have an amazing gift. It's just that most of us don't realize we have it or are using it in a negative fashion. It sounds like hocus pocus and it's difficult for some people to believe in because the rewards are usually intangible in the short term. But our lives reflect our thought patterns and are the products of our imaginations. If you visualize what you want, you will make decisions and take actions that bring you closer to that goal. Even if some of those decisions and actions will be a result of subconscious thinking. If you're a negative person, you will get negative outcomes. If you're a positive person, you will get positive outcomes. It's a choice we make. A few days after the attack, a big group of us flew back to the UK on British Airways. We were herded into cattle class at the back of the plane, but shortly after taking off, one of the flight attendants opened the curtain and said, Is one of you Mr Ollerton? I made myself known, took down my gear from the overhead locker and smiled at the chuntering of my colleagues. It would seem that the pilot I'd met in the Intercontinental Hotel had arranged an upgrade. Either Dave's girl didn't have as much clout or she wasn't as impressed. The flight attendant led me up to first class and put me in seat 1A. While the other lads were sitting with their knees up to their chins, I was reclining with a bottle of champagne. I couldn't help peering back down the aisle, raising my glass and giving my colleagues the biggest grin imaginable. And when I woke up from a nap, I found another bottle of champagne sitting next to me. I've had worse flights. I got attacked by a chimp and met Bridget Bardot. I got attacked in Iraq and met a very accommodating pilot. However weird and messed up the situation I find myself in, I always manage to find a gem in there somewhere. My life has always been like that. I'd find a silver lining in a mushroom cloud. But that's what happens when you have a relentlessly positive outlook. Chapter 14. Tempting Death. Shortly after that incident, I left ABC and went to work for an oil company as an independent consultant. My role was to look after two directors, ferrying them in and out of Baghdad. It was a good job, and I was soon negotiating a permanent contract. Facilitating the logistics meant dealing with the boss's personal assistant, an Australian girl called Nat who worked in London. We immediately hit it off and before long were flirting with each other over the phone and via email. When I was back in London for the company's Christmas party, we arranged to meet, and from that point on, we were virtually inseparable. It was clear that my marriage to Helen was unsalvageable. So pretty much as soon as I met Nat, I phoned and told her I wouldn't be coming home again. Nat and I found a swanky flat in Chiswick, and for the first time in as long as I could remember, life was almost perfect. I didn't know life could be that good. Every second I was with Nat, I was like a kid at Christmas. I never signed a contract with Nat's company because the job would have required me spending most of my time in Baghdad and I much preferred the idea of doing six months on, six months off. But around the same time, Mick and another mate called Andy, who I'd served with in the SBS, set up a security company almost overnight. There was a lot of that going on in Iraq at the time and won a contract with the telecoms company who were putting the mobile network back into Baghdad. So I started working for them. It was as easy as that. There were contracts flying around like confetti in Iraq in 2003-2004. stroke Mick and Andy's concept was a great one. The security company consisted of a small contingent of Westerners, all ex-special forces and about 2,000 Iraqis who were trained in bodyguard skills, convoy logistics, site and transit security. We acquired a lot of Saddam's old villas, about six or seven of them dotted around Baghdad, as well as some of his old armoured Mercedes. 
We used the Iraqis as the workforce while we maintained a low profile. This was essential because the telecoms company had its HQ in the city's red zone, which meant it was considered unsafe. By contrast, the American contractors would be hanging out of the windows of their vehicles with weapons. They took the view that they should be as conspicuous as possible, which is just the American way. They'd be yee-hawing and high-fiving. This was fine by us because it meant they drew most of the unwanted attention. Meanwhile, we were driving around in the armored Mercedes with the blacked out windows, just like the attackers on the highway. But that way of operating carried risks because it made us look more local than Western, which meant our biggest threat was actually the Americans. It really was like the Wild West. Actually, it was more like Mad Max. Getting into the green zone, the fortified neighborhood that was home to government buildings, foreign embassies and businesses, wasn't easy. Because I spent a lot of time driving around Baghdad on my own, tooled up with an AK-47 and a Glock 19 pistol while wearing body armor. Luckily, I still had my ID card from the SBS. I'd drive up to checkpoints, pop my visor down, which had a uni jack on it, and show them the card. The Americans manning the checkpoint thought we were still serving and would go crazy. Fuck, man. We got special forces coming in. Go, go, go. We'd wind the windows back up and laugh our heads off. The first Thursday working for the company, I said to the guys, what's happening tonight? We've got the party. A party? I wasn't expecting that. I didn't imagine Baghdad to be much of a party town. As it turned out, every Thursday, there was a bash for the telecoms company's employees and our Jordanian partners, who were in charge of recruiting all the manpower. Friday was a non-working day, so everyone would go to this party and get shit-faced. Our job was primarily to look after the clients, but we were allowed to enjoy ourselves. I turned up to this villa, which was one of Saddam's old places, placed my weapon on the floor, stashed my body armor under my chair, grabbed a beer and waited for the guests to arrive. Everywhere you looked was marble and gold. It was really quite hideous. Just as you'd expect a dictator's villa to look. When the first guest knocked on the door, I instinctively reached for my weapon and one of the lads had to tell me to relax. The last time I'd been in Iraq was during Desert Storm, so it took me a while to feel comfortable as an ex-Special Forces soldier in one of Saddam's old villas. With people getting pissed and smoking so much weed, you could barely see your hand in front of your face. The party was beginning to liven up when the door flung open and 13 women wearing burqas filed through. They stepped down into this sunken lounge and in perfect unison, removed their burkas. There was no verbal command, it was almost choreographed. And now, standing before me were 13 women in skimpy, brightly coloured lingerie and hooker heels. I'd never seen anything like it in the West, and I certainly didn't expect to see anything like it in Baghdad. Selection interrogation was trippy, but it had nothing on this. I soon learned that they were Saddam's old prostitutes. We had his old villas, we had his old cars, and why not the hookers as well? And throughout the night, they were in and out of bedrooms with our clients. The clients were all shit-faced, and after they'd fallen asleep, the girls would go around the rooms and nick everything they could lay their hands on. They lifted Rolex watches, jewellery, and bulging wallets. Some idiot even left his safe open with piles of cash inside. That all disappeared. The last stop was the kitchen, which they cleaned out of food before putting the burkas back on and leaving. I can't imagine what they'd been through, so good luck to them. We were taking delivery of piles of weapons and ammunition every day. So we built an army in a heartbeat and had three massive villas interconnected with gun positions on every high point. Whenever we needed to do a logistics move of equipment, we would use locals with connections to the militia to pave our way. The locals would speak to tribal leaders, pay them cash, and our convoys would be secured throughout that district. The operation was seamless. We were bringing in millions of dollars of equipment unhindered, and our setup was the envy of many. We moved on from telecoms and got a job with Schneider Electric, putting the grid back into Iraq. Whenever we moved transformers into the country, I'd put big sheets over the lorries with Iraqi power for the Iraqi people, 
written on them in Arabic. In other words, don't fucking shoot. The parties continued, each week in a different villa, each week with Saddam's ex-prostitutes going through the same routine. And perhaps not unsurprisingly, complacency began to set in. Brian was a special forces soldier who had gone native. He'd been in Iraq a long time, had dark skin, a big beard, and had grown his hair long, so blended in with the locals. He'd also met a local girl called Iman at one of the parties, not one of the prostitutes, I hasten to add, and started a relationship. Because Brian had been in the SBS a long time, climbed K2, and was a former bodyguard to the Beckhams, he was like a god to the rest of us, and we were all a bit in awe of him. One day, Brian came into the compound and asked if he could have some weapons, because he was going to a party in Dora. Dora was a very active neighbourhood of Baghdad and a place to stay away from. I was supposed to be meeting him at the airport the following morning, because I was going on leave and I'd hooked him up with some business people in Indonesia. I reminded him of that, told him to be careful, and he shrugged and said, don't worry about me, before waltzing off with his weapons. What I should have said was, mate, don't go, it's too risky. But that's only with the benefit of hindsight. Brian was an intimidating character and vastly experienced. I thought he'd have his fun and get home safe. When Brian didn't turn up at the airport, we suspected something bad had happened. It wasn't like him not to be in touch and not like anyone not to turn up at the airport to get the hell out of that place. But I got my plane and flew back to London. It was only the following day while I was sat in a cafe that I got the dreadful phone call. The Americans had found Brian's body down a back street, shot to bits. Apparently the party he was at had been ambushed by militia, who had heard there were Westerners in attendance. Brian's girlfriend, Iman, and three other women were slaughtered. But a 15-year-old girl called Sarah survived. She'd been shot through the head, but the bullet had exited without hitting her brain. We managed to get hold of Sarah and put her in a villa, which I suppose was our version of witness protection. It eventually came out that the police had stormed the party. Brian had made a run for it and been gunned down. When I say the police, I mean it in the loosest of senses. There had been a massive recruitment drive and the locals would turn up, get uniformed and weapons and disappear into the ether. Often, people you thought were the police were actually militia. Their Glock pistols were supplied by the Americans and any of the Glocks that didn't end up in the hands of the militia were sold onto the black market from where we bought them back for the company. That's what it was like in Iraq at the time. You didn't know if anyone was who they said they were and who was carrying what. Some of the stuff I did and saw could have come straight from the film Apocalypse Now. One day, my mate Denny had to pretend I was a hostage to get me through a checkpoint. Denny was dark-skinned, looked quite wild, and could have passed for a local. But as funny as we found it, we could have been killed. I'd watch Chinooks coming into the airport carrying pallets of banknotes, piles and piles of them wrapped in cellophane. That was the American way of trying to rebuild the economy, chucking money at everything. But anyone with half a brain could have worked out that if you flood a war zone with money, an awful lot of it will end up in the wrong hands. I'd read papers and there'd be articles complaining about how much the war was costing, but I'd ask myself the question, how much is it making the businesses involved in the rebuilding process? One of the American engineering and construction companies was called KBR. And the joke was that it stood for Keep Bush Rich. The war was a business opportunity for the Americans, a money-making enterprise, which is why it became very difficult for non-US companies to win contracts, including us. In the end, Sarah's whereabouts were discovered and we received intelligence that there was going to be an attack on our villa. So we got to a safe house in Jordan. We were pushing for legal action to be taken against the police, which was tricky, because nobody knew who the police were when we heard that Sarah had disappeared. Consequently, the case was thrown out of court because of insufficient evidence. I don't know what became of her. Brian's death was a terrible shock. I worked with him for a long time. He was a close friend. I hadn't lost many friends in the military. There was my mate who died in the parachute accident in Nevada. But when I was in Northern Ireland and the IRA were trying to blow us up, they didn't get any of us. And it was the same as when I was in Iraq as a soldier. 
I felt guilty for not having tried to persuade Brian not to go to the party. It would have been a difficult conversation, but had I spoken up, he might still have been alive. Even if he told me where to go, at least I could have said I tried. I should have trusted my instincts. Instead, I took the easier option, which was the biggest mistake of my career. Brian's death was also a major blow for the company because we'd always wanted to keep a low profile and now we are all over the news. We were given warnings that if we ever worked on a military contract, there would be consequences for the anti-coalition forces. We were looking at such contracts at the time. We also had Iraqis working for us who would have known about it. And an envelope containing a bullet was thrown over the wall of the compound. Also in the envelope was a note written in Arabic stating that if we didn't stop talking to the Americans, they'd send bullets with our names on. Brian had become too localised, too blasé and pushed his luck too far. But we were all guilty of that. Being in a war zone takes its toll. We didn't have the support networks we had when we were in the military or the same umbrella of protection. It reached a stage where I honestly thought I'd leave Iraq in a coffin. The situation in Baghdad was deteriorating. We were hearing stories all the time about people being attacked and convoys being smashed. We had to encase our villas with steel on the inside. When we heard rounds coming close, we had to lock everything down. It really started kicking off in 2004-2005. There was a big price on any Westerner's head and one day four of our team got kidnapped. When we were on the phone trying to negotiate their release, we could hear another guy in the background having his head cut off. The screams, the commotion and the gargling of blood. We got them out eventually, which took money and certain assurances that we'd stop exploring contracts with the Americans. It was horribly stressful and a very surreal situation, but there were lives at stake, so I literally had to block out the background noise. It was no different to fighting in a war. Whatever atrocities were going on around me, I had to keep them to the back of my mind and stay focused on the objective. Another time I was in the office typing an email and a rocket-propelled grenade flew straight past the window and flattened a villa across the road. I looked up momentarily before going back to typing. There were three of us in the office at the time and nobody said a word, flinched or even raised an eyebrow. That's how immune we'd become to all the chaos that was going on around us. We had Iraqi bodyguards, but I suspected that if the shit hit the fan, their loyalty would only stretch so far. We didn't know who was who, and we knew there were people in our ranks who were dodgy. I slept with a pistol under my pillow and other weapons placed in strategic positions around the room. I'd lie in bed imagining the door being kicked open and a militia storming in. I didn't know what anxiety was, but it was certainly showing some signs of the symptoms, including panic and uneasiness, which was hardly surprising. But like Brian, I got complacent. I started doing things I shouldn't have. I just didn't seem to have any value for my life. We were being paid a fortune, but it was relative to the shit conditions we were living in. Our insurance policies weren't credible, so we had our own policy. If anyone was blown up or shot and badly maimed, we'd shoot each other dead. I felt a massive sense of guilt at having left my wife and son and was drinking as a coping mechanism at every opportunity. As soon as I finished work, I hit the bottle. And it wasn't just me. Everyone would down tools and get shit-faced in the villa. That was the military culture and the habits were deep-seated. It was never a light session. There would be gallons of lager and whiskey, sometimes dope. Just about anything was available on the streets of Baghdad. I was blacking out almost every night, then waking up the next morning and not being able to remember what happened the night before. And when you're drinking that much, the visualisation trick doesn't really work. Your mind is confused. It's like trying to navigate in a fog. Being the boss allowed me to employ pretty much anyone I wanted. So before I knew it, I was surrounded by my old mates from the military. Mostly lads I served with in the Royal Marines. Having them with me meant being able to have some fun amid the mayhem. One of the lads was called Benny from Commandos Training 576 Troop. Benny was an amazing musician and had a band called Long Spoon. He recorded tracks for his new album in Baghdad and we'd listen to him sing on the roof of our villa while the sun went down. Bullets whizzed overhead, explosions went off in the distance and mosques called to prayer. 
There was one track in particular, Symphony of Man, that summed up our situation. In the heart of this troubled land, there's a disease, a conflict of man. But all the time you're trying to pull the old military trick of having a drink and laughing or singing things off, all that chaos compounds in your head. You might not be thinking about it at the time, but it's lurking in a more dangerous place, which is your subconscious. And that just makes you anxious. That's how I met my new friend, Valium. Someone recommended it for my anxiety. I bought some off the black market and it quickly became a habit. Before I knew it, I was popping three or four Valium a day, which provided another layer of fog. It put me on a different parallel where Helen, Luke, home, and all of life's harsh realities that I feared terribly didn't exist. We get threat warnings from the US State Department telling us which areas to steer clear of. Sometimes there will be a total lockdown. One day, we were told not to leave the building at all, but I wasn't having it. It was my stubbornness coming to the fore again. Because I'd been told not to go out, I was determined to go out. I was country manager. I ran the show in Iraq on rotation with another guy. So I thought I could do what I wanted. And if I'm honest, the threat excited me. So I told my bodyguards that I wanted to buy a rug. They tried to talk me out of it, but I wasn't budging. It sounds absurd, and it was. We headed to the Al Mansour district in a three-car convoy. And when we arrived at the rug shop, I ran straight in and started negotiating with the owner while lying on the floor. I had my body armor on, my MP5 by my side, and I haggled for ages. No, no, I'm not paying that. Eventually, I managed to get him down $2,000. But as I was counting out this big wad of cash... One of the bodyguards came flying through the door. The militia were on their way and it was time to say goodbye. I paid the money. One of the bodyguards grabbed the rug and we crawled out of the shop. As we were driving off, bullets started coming down the side of the car and a couple flew straight through the rear window. It may sound crazy, but I found it fun. I got a buzz from buying a rug when I wasn't supposed to and having to escape while being shot at. It made me feel alive. Most people would enjoy the quiet times, but I hated being stuck in my villa doing nothing in particular, just as I hated the downtime in the SBS. I wasn't thinking about the possible consequences of my actions. Didn't give a shit. If it happened, it happened. That was my peace in war. I felt so at home in that environment. As crazy as it sounds, dodging bullets, living in fear... And banging back Valium to deal with it made a lot more sense than being back in the UK, listening to the incessant chatter of everyday life. I'm sure I would have felt a bit different had I ended up on YouTube having my head sawn off, but I didn't. I'd escaped with my new rug, and a very nice rug it was too. It now has pride of place on a wall in my house, and I smile every time I pass it. One night, I left a party, jumped in my car, and started driving around the city on my own. Nobody ever did that. You were supposed to turn up, get shit-faced and stay overnight at the villa. The Americans were crashing about all over the place. There were bangs going off everywhere and soon I was hopelessly lost. It was an open invitation to take me hostage and because I'd forgotten my ID card, even if the Americans had stopped me, I would have been in trouble. I knew I needed to get to a high point so I could work out where I was. I reached a bridge, opened the door and my AK-47 hit the deck, shortly followed by me. Luckily, I wasn't so pissed that I couldn't make out some of the main landmarks below, and I managed to point my car in the right direction and get home. I was pushing and pushing and pushing, almost begging for some kind of hideous event that would end everything. It was the same situation as when I was a teenager, spiralling out of control. But there was no long arm of the law you could rely on in Baghdad or mum to reach out and stop me. I'd have moments of clarity and reflection when I'd conclude that I needed to leave Iraq. But I'd be doing something else stupid a few days later. There were good times in Baghdad, but they were overshadowed by the darkness of my mental state and the drinking. I was out of control. Baghdad was out of control. I don't know how I lasted so long. I don't know how I lasted at all.